Hello everybody, my name is Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're going to cover chapter 12 of biology and this chapter is titled The Cell Cycle. In this chapter we're going to discuss how the ability of organisms um, to produce more of their own kind is the one characteristic that best distinguishes living things from non-living matter. This unique capacity to procreate like all biological functions, has a cellular basis. And the continuity of life is based on the reproduction of cells or cell division. So then in this chapter, the main objectives of and the main objectives and points that we want to cover are the following. Most cell division results in genetically identical daughter cells. Two, the mitotic phase alternates with the interphase in the cell cycle and then three the eukaryotic cell cycle is regulated by a molecular control system we will cover the question ultimately of how does one parent cell give rise to two genetically identical daughter cells and the answer lies in these three cell stages of the cell cycle interphase where the cell grows prepares for cell division and the chromosomes are duplicated Two, mitosis, the chromosomes copy and they're separated from each other and move to the ends of the cell. And three, cytokinesis, where the cell divides into two daughter cells. We will answer the question, how does one parent cell give rise to two genetically identical daughters? By working through the details of these three stages. Now, let's start with our first objective that most cell division results in genetically identical daughter cells. Cell division plays several important roles in your life and in life in general. When a, pro a prokaryotic cell divides, it's actually reproducing because the process gives rise to a new organism, another cell. And the same is true of any uni unicellular eukaryote. As for multicellular eukaryotes, cell division enables each of these organisms to develop from a single cell, the fertilized egg. And cell division continues to function in renewal and in repair in fully grown multicellular eukaryotes, replacing cells that die from accidents or normal wear and tear. For example, dividing cells in your bone marrow they continuously make new blood cells. Now, in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes, a crucial function of most cell divisions is the distribution of identical genetic material, DNA, to two daughter cells. And what is, let's say, most remarkable about cell division is the accuracy with which that DNA is passed from one generation to another to the next. A dividing cell will replicate its DNA. It's going to distribute the two copies to opposite ends of the cell, and then it's going to split its daughter cells, right? This DNA molecule, it carries several hundred to a few thousand genes, the units of information that specify an organism's inherited traits. It, it encodes the associated proteins that maintain the structure of the chromosome and help control the activity of the genes, as well as a million other things in your bodies. And together, the entire complex of DNA and proteins that is the building materials of chromosome is together referred to as chromatin. And as you will see soon, the chromatin of a chromosome varies in its degree of condensation during the process of cell division. But... Nevertheless, an important process from start to finish. One of the multiple chromosomes in eukaryotic cell is represented here. All right. At this stage, it is a long, thin chromatin fiber containing one DNA molecule and its associated proteins. All right. So here we have our chromosome. All right. Once duplicated, once we duplicate this chromosome, all right, we have two sister chromatids connected along their entire length by sister chromatid co cohesion. All right, now this, this one chromosome is DNA wrapped around along with associated proteins that help it maintain 
that tight um, um, degree of, of condensation, that tight degree of, of winding up around itself. All right, now every eukaryotic species has a characteristic number of chromosomes in each cell nucleus. So for example, the nuclei of human somatic cells, those are all body cells except your reproductive cells. Those are called your somatic cells. They all contain 46 chromosomes. So they're made out of two sets of 23. One set is inherited from each parent. How does that work? Well, your reproductive cells, your, your gametes, these are your sperm and eggs. They actually have half as many chromosomes as your somatic cells. So in, in, in our example, human gametes have one set of 23 chromosomes. And when you're creating new life, all right, your child will have your one set of 23 chromosomes and your partner's 23 set of chromosomes, all right, to create life essentially. When a cell is not dividing, and even as it replicates its DNA in preparation for cell division, each chromosome is in the form of a long, thin chromatin fiber like we just mentioned. All right. After DNA replication, however, the chromosomes condense as part of cell division. Each chromatin, each chromatin fiber becomes densely coiled and folded. All right. That makes the chromosome much shorter and so thick that you can actually see it under a light microscope. Now, each duplicated chromosome consists of two sister chromatids. These are joined copies of the original chromosome. The two chromatids each contain an identical DNA molecule that are often attached all along their length by protein complexes called cohesions. Uh, or cohesins, I don't know. I'll spell it out just to make sure I'm... Cohesins. This attachment, like we said, this is known as a sister chromatid cohesion. Each sister chromatid has a centromere. This is a region made out of repetitive sequences in the chromosomal DNA where the chromatid is attached most closely to its sister chromatid. All right, so those are the first two steps. Let's, let's reiterate, right? Repetition is key. All right, you have chromosome. All right, this is your DNA, all right, and it, it's preparing for cell division. So it is densely coiled and folded with the help of proteins, all right? Your DNA is, is, is densely coiled and folded with the help of proteins, and that unit is called a chromosome. You have two copies. They are tightly connected to each other as well. We call these sister chromatids. All right, they have a centromere. All right, that's the center of them here that I'm going to highlight in red. All right, the centromere is a region made out of repetitive sequences, all right, where the chromatid is attached most closely to its sister chromatid. And that attachment is meditated by or, or mediated by, sorry, proteins that recognize and they bind to the centromeric DNA. Each bound proteins condense the DNA, giving this duplicated chromosome like this narrow, narrow waist, right? This thick waist. All right. Now, the portion of a chromatid to either side of the centromere is referred to the arm of the chromatid, right? One arm, two arm. All right. Later in the cell division process, the two sister chromatids of each duplicated chromosome, they're going to separate and they're going to move into two new nuclei. All right, they'll separate and they'll move into two new nuclei, one forming at each end of the cell. Once this, those sister chromatids separate, they no longer are called sister chromatids, but they're considered individual chromosomes. And this is the step that essentially doubles the number of chromosomes during cell division. And so with that, thus, each new nucleus receives a collection of chromosomes identical to that of a parent cell. Mitosis is the division of the genetic material in the nucleus, and it's usually followed immediately by cytokinesis, which is the division of the cytoplasm. One cell has now become two. Each has the genetic equivalent of the parent cell. All right. So that, in short, helps us think about our first objective. 
All right, and here I kind of have it written down as a summary, right? Cells replicate their genetic material before they divide. Each daughter cell receives a copy of the DNA. Prior to cell division, you have chromosomes that are duplicated. Each of them consists of two identical sister chromatids that are joined along their length by sister chromatid cohesion, and they're held together at a constricted region at the centromere. When that cohesion is broken, the chromatids separate during cell division, becoming the chromosome, becoming the chromosomes of their daughter cells. All right. Eukaryotic cell division consists of mitosis, which is the division of the nucleus, and cytokinesis, which is the division of the cytoplasm. With that, we can move into our second objective, which is that the mitotic phase alternates with the interphase in the cell cycle. So let's make sense of that. Mitosis is just one part of the cell cycle. All right, it's just one part of the cell cycle, the life of a cell from the time that it first is formed during cell division of a parent cell until its own division into two daughter cells. In fact, the mitotic phase or the M phase, which is what we'll call it, includes both mitosis and cytokinesis it's usually the shortest part of the cell cycle, all right? The mitotic phase alternates with a much longer stage called the interphase, which actually accounts for about 90%, 90% of the cycle, all right? So we have interphase, all right? And we have the mitotic phase, all right? This accounts for 90% usually of the cell cycle all right now what what consists of interphase right we talked about the mitotic phase being mitosis and cytokinesis what's the interphase part what what does that include it includes three phases we're going to call it the g1 phase or the first gap the s phase or the synthesis phase and then the g2 phase or the second gap all right, these G phases were misnamed as gaps when they were first observed because, you know, they kind of, the cells kind of appeared inactive. But now we know that these, these, these phases, these G phases, are phases of intense metabolic activity and growth that occurred throughout the interface. Now, during all three phases of interface, actually, a cell is growing by producing proteins and cytoplasmic organelles like mitochondria mitochondria and endoplasmic reticulum um it's du the duplication of the chromosomes that are crucial for eventual um, division of the cell occur entirely during the s phase all right and so we see that these three phases and in interphase are really important in preparation for the mitotic phase right a cell grows during g1 it continues to grow as it copies in its chromosomes in the s phase and it grows even more to complete its preparation for cell division in g2 before um it starts the mitotic phase and the daughter cells obviously may repeat the cycle now mitosis is conventionally also broken down into other stages all right so let's do this we start off Essentially, in G1 phase, this is where metabolic activity and growth happen. All right, you have your unduplicated chromosomes. Then you move into S phase, where you continue metabolic activity, growth, and DNA synthesis. And by near the end, you have duplicated chromosomes and move into um, the G phase, where now you are preparing further um, other, other things that you need before you start into the mitotic phase. All right, so your interphase is all just preparation for the mitotic phase. All right, now when you get to the mitotic phase, you start off with mitosis, and mitosis consists itself of five stages. Prophase, prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. All right, and then overlapping with the latter stages of mitosis, then you can move into cytokinesis, which completes the mitotic phase. And we're actually going to go in details of each of these phases so your g2 of interphase right before you start the m phase the mitotic phase what's happening here is you're going to have a nuclear envelope that encloses the nucleus all right the nucleus now contains one or more nucleoli nucleoli all right you have two centrosomes that have formed by duplication of a single centrosome all right here's your duplicated centrosomes 
all right? And chromosomes that were duplicated during the S phase, they cannot be seen individually yet because they haven't condensed yet, all right? That happens in the mitotic phase. All right, so now we move into mitosis. All right, now we can move into mitosis, which has five stages, the first being prophase. In prophase, the chromatin fibers become more tightly coiled and condense into discrete chromosomes that you can now see under a microscope. All right, the nucleoli, all right, begins to disappear. And each du duplicated microsome appears as two identical sister chromatids. All right, that are joined together by the centromeres and often along their arms by cohesion. All right, so now you can see the sister chromatids. All right, in addition, the mitotic spindle begins to form. It's composed of centromeres and the microtubules that extend from them. We're going to discuss this in more details here in the next section. All right. And what you have is that the radial arrays of the shorter microtubules that extend from the, uh, from the centromeres, they're called asters. All right, so you have this formation here of, of, of that. All right, the centromeres, they move away from each other. They're propelled partly by lengthening microtubules between them. In the prometaphase, the nuclear envelope fragments. It begins to fragment and disappear. All right, the microtubules extending from each centromere which has now moved to opposite sides all right can now invade the nuclear era area all right so now you have centromeres at each side all right that have microtubules connecting from them that kind of scape the landscape of of the nucleus the nuclear area the chromosomes actually have become even more condensed all right and now a kinetic core which is a specialized protein structure has now formed at the centros centromere of each chromatid all right so we begin to form this kin kinetic core structure um, at the center of each chromatid so that means two per chromosome some of the chromo uh, some of those microtubules attach to the kinetic cores all right which jerk the chromosomes back and forth all right this is going to be important later on during the separation all right, and the non-kinetic core microtubules, they interact with the opposite pole of the spindle, lengthening the cell. All right, then we move into the metaphase. Here in the metaphase, the, centros the centrosomes are now at opposite poles. All right, exactly at opposite poles, more, even more so than the prometaphase. The chromosomes have arrived at, at the metaphase plate, right? They, they center themselves here near the middle a plane that is equidistant between the spindles at the two poles. All right, and the chromosome centromeres now, uh, centro, uh, centromeres, they lie at that metaphase plate. And for each chromosome, the kinetic cores at the sister chromatids are attached to the kinetic core microtubules coming from the opposite poles. So what you see is these chromosomes are lined at the center. These are sister chromatids and you have microtubules that attach to the kinetic cores in the center of those sister chromatids. And as you can anticipate, what's going to happen in the next stage is these microtubules are going to push those sister chromatids apart so that each half of that sister chromatid goes to a different part of this one cell to then form two new cells that have both. All right, but I'm jumping ahead. So we're going to go into anaphase next. This is the shortest stage of my mitosis. It begins when the cohesion proteins are cleaved, and this allows the two sister chromatids of each pair to part suddenly. All right, they've been torn apart, these, these sister chromatids, and they go to opposite sides of the cell, being pushed by these centrosomes um, at once at each spindle pole. All right, the two new daughter cell chromosomes begin moving towards opposite sides, ends of the cell. All right, and their kinetic core microtubules shorten as they pull them towards the opposite ends. The cell elongates now, um, and by the end of anaphase, the two ends of the cell have identical and complete collection of chromosomes. Now we move into the telophase. Two daughter nuclei form in the cell, and the nuclear envelope arises from the fragment of the parent cell's nuclear envelope. All right, the nucleoli reappear, the chromosomes become less condensed, any remaining spindle microtubules are depolymerized, 
All right, and mitosis, the, cell, the, the division of one nucleus into two is now complete. We have this little, like, formation of these two new cells that are about to break apart, which actually happens in cytokinesis. The division of the cytoplasm is usually well underway by late telophase, and so the two daughter cells appear shortly after the end of mitosis in the phase of cytokinesis. In animal cells, cytokinesis involves the formation of the cleavage furrow, which pinches the cells into two. All right. Now, many of the events of mitosis, as you've noticed, depend on the mitotic spindle. So we're going to cover that. All right. The mitotic spindle, which begins to form uh, in the cytoplasm during prophase. All right. This structure it consists of fibers made out of microtubules and their associated proteins. And while the mitotic spindle assembles, the other microtubules of the cytoskeleton partially desemble, providing the material used to create this mitotic spindle. All right, the spindle microtubules elongate by incorporating more subunits of the protein tubulin. And actually, in animal cells, the assembly of the spindle microtubules, they start at the centrosome, which is a subcellular region that contains the materials that function throughout the cell to organize the cell's microtubules. And then during interphase in animal cells, the single centrosome duplicates, forming two which remain near, near the nucleus. Now, the two centrosomes that move apart during prophase and prometaphase of mitosis as spindle microtubules grow, grow out of them, all right, they grow out of them as they move apart. And by the end of prometaphase, the two centrosomes, one at each pole of the spindle, are now at opposite ends of the cells with their microtubules coming out of them. That helps them elongate the cell. And an ester, which is a radial array of short microtubules, extend from each of the centrosomes. And the spindle includes the centrosomes, the spindle microtubules, and the esters. All right, so the, when we talk about, ignore that, when we talk about mitotic spindle, we're referring to the centrosomes, the short microtubules called esters that extend out of it, and the longer microtubules that extend and during later stages will connect with the kinetic cores of the chromosomes. All right. Now, when the when each of the two sister chromatids, um, what, each of the two sister chromatids, like we made mention of earlier, um, of of the duplicated chromosome, they have a center core. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, a kinetic core. That kinetic core is a structure that's made up of proteins that have assembled on a specific section of DNA at each centromere. Now, the chromosome's two kinetic cores face in opposite directions, and during prometaphase, some of the spindle microtubules will attach to the kinetic cores, and these are called kinetic core microtubules. All right, so here are your sister chromatids. They have two kinetic cores, all right, and your microtubules will attach to them, right, those microtubules coming from the, centro, uh, the centromeres or the centrosomes, I'm sorry, all right, and they'll connect to the two kinetic cores, and this will help in the separation of the two sister uh, chromosomes, these sister chromatids. Now, when one of the chromosome's kinetic cores is captured by microtubules, the chromosomes begin to move toward the pole from which that microtubule extends. However, this movement comes to a halt as soon as microtubules from the opposite poles attach to the kinetic core on the other chromatid. What happens next is kind of like a tug of war that ends in a draw. And the chromosomes move first in one direction and then in another and back and forth, finally settling midway between the two ends of the cell. And then at metaphase, at metaphase, um, 
actually, let's not skip ahead. At metaphase, you'll have these chromosomes lined up on that metaphase plate. At metaphase, the centromeres um, of the duplicated chromosomes are on a plane midway between the spindle's two poles, which we call the metaphase plate. It's like an imaginary plate rather than an actual cellular structure, but that's because of that tug of war um, back and forth leading to them kind of ending up in this center plane. And after that, well, eventually the sister chromatids will separate. Motor proteins um, are going to move them along kinetochore microtubules towards the opposite ends of the cell. And then the cell will elongate after they're separated. Um, the cell elongates when motor proteins push non-kinetochore microtubules from opposite poles away from each other as well. And mitosis as you know, is usually followed by cytokinesis. And that's this next phase here, right? Mito mitosis is usually followed, followed by cytokinesis. Animal cells carry out cytokinesis by cleavage, and plant cells um, will actually form a cell plate. Now, during binary fission in bacteria, the chromosomes replicate and the daughter chromosomes actively will just move apart. Some of the proteins involved in bacterial binary fission are Will, are related to eukaryotic actin and tubulin that help do that separation and cytokinesis. But since, um, but for, for eukaryotes and prokaryotes, the, there'll be a formation of like a cleavage furo that will then break off into two different cells. Now, prokaryotes precede eukaryotes by actually more than a billion years. And so it's likely that mitosis evolved from prokaryotic cell division um, certain unicellular eukaryotes exhibit mechanisms of t cell division that is very similar to those of, uh, of, of ancestors of existing eukaryotes. Um, such mechanisms actually represent intermediate steps in the evolution of mitosis. But essentially, mitosis is followed by cytokinesis, um, where in animal cells we see that as a cleavage, in plant cells we see that as the formation of a cell plate. And that's the important distinction to make here between animal and plant cells. All right. Now, last but not least, we can move into our third and final objective. The eukaryotic cell cycle is regulated by molecular control system. Signaling molecules present in the cytoplasm actually regulate process, progress throughout the cell cycle. In the cell cycle control system, cyclic changes in regulatory, in regulatory proteins Things that, in, including things like cyclins and cyclin-dependent kinases, work as the cell cycle clock. All right, the cell cycle clock stops at specific checkpoints until there's a go-ahead signal that is received that tells the cell cycle to continue. Important checkpoints actually occur in the G1 phase. All right, G2 phase. All right, and the M phases as well. All right, so what? how this works is that cyclin-dependent kinases, these are enzymes that control the progression of the cell cycle by phosphorylating specific target proteins, will allow and, and tell and, and note to the cell cycle whether to continue at different checkpoints. The activity of these cyclin-dependent kinases is regulated by the presence of cyclins, which will bind to the cyclin-dependent kinases and activate them. Different cyclins are, pro are produced at different points in the cell cycle, and the binding of cyclins to cyclin-dependent kinases causes a conformational change in the cyclin-dependent kinases that will enable them to phosphorylate specific target proteins and allow them and, and tell and, and, and relay the message of, oh, continue the cell cycle, move to the next checkpoint, and so on and so forth. These phosphorylated proteins then initiate the events necessary for cell cycle progression. Now, the, cell, the cyclin levels, they will rise during the S and G2 phase and then fall abruptly during the M phase. The initials MPF that you see here, all right, MPF, they, this stands for maturi, maturing or uh, matri, 
maturation promoting factor. But we can think of MPF as M phase promoting factor because it triggers the cell's passage into the M phase past the G2 checkpoint. So when cyclins that accumulate during G2 associate with cyclin-dependent kinase molecules, the resulting MPF complex is active, it phosphorylates a variety of uh, proteins, and it essentially initiates mitosis. When the function of cyclins and cyclin-dependent kinases is disrupt disrupted, then the si cell cycle can be arrested, or cells can undergo uncontrolled division that leads to cancer and other cells. These checkpoints in the cell cycle pretty much ensure that the cycle doesn't progress until specific conditions are met, such as the proper completion of DNA replication or the correct alignment of chromosomes during mitosis. All right. And you can see, right, cyclin concentration versus MPF activity. And you can see that the synthesis of cyclin begins in late S phase, continues through G2. And because cyclin is protected from degradation during this stage, it accumulates, it accumulates. Cyclin combines with CDK and it promotes MPF. And when there's em enough MPF molecules that accumulate, the cell passes through the G2 checkpoint and begins mitosis. MPF promotes mitosis by phosphorylating various proteins and it peaks during metaphase. During anaphase, the cyclin uh, component of MPF is then degraded and it terminates the M phase, and the cell enters the G1 phase again. During G1, the degradation of cyclin continues, and the CDK component of MPF is recycled. Now, in addition, there are internal and external signals. Um, there are also internal and external signals that control the cell cycle checkpoints through things like signal transduction pathways. For many cells, the G1 checkpoint seems to be the most important. Um, if, a, if a cell receives a go-ahead signal at the G1 checkpoint, it will usually complete the G1, S, G2, and M phase and divide. If it doesn't receive a go-ahead signal at that point, it may exit the cycle and then switch into a non-dividing state called the G0 phase. Phase. All right, now internal signals can be something like a growth factor. A growth factor is a protein that's released by certain cells that stimulate other cells to divide. Different cell types respond specifically to different growth factors um, or combinations of growth factors. So that's one kind of internal um, signal control as well. Um, there's also external signal controls. The effect of an external physical factor on cell division is clearly seen in density de dependent inhibition, which is a phenomenon in which crowded cells just stop dividing. Most animal cells also exhibit anchorage dependence, so that's another external sing signal. Um, to divide, they must be attached to something. That's what anchorage dependence is. Um, they have to be attached to something like the inside of a culture flask or the extracellular matrix of a tissue, um, so something like that. Most cells actually exhibit density-dependent inhibition of cell division as well as anchorage de dependence. But like mentioned earlier, um, when things go wrong, when, when there's not proper control of the cell cycle, things like cancer cells and other diseases can, can, can result from that. Cancer cells elude normal cell cycle regulation. And what, what will happen is they'll divide unchecked and they'll form tumors. And malignant tumors invade nearby cells and then they can inform, they, they can undergo metastasis, which exports cell cycles to other sites where they can form secondary tumors. And that's how cancer can not only form, but spread throughout your body. And so obviously regulation of the cell cycle is very important in the prevention of things like cancer and other diseases. All right, that's all I have for you guys. I hope this was helpful. Let me know if you have any comments, questions, concerns down below. Other than that, good luck, happy studying, and have a beautiful, beautiful day.